talking about the, the death of PCNL, of course, we need to remember what we did in the past, in the, pre the present, and what we can expect for, for the future. I must say that um, in my practice, I like this sentence from uh, Ralph Clement that you all know, from knife to needle to nothing, and we can reformulate this uh, sentence to, uh, from open surgery to PCNL and to uh, retrograde intrarenal surgery. We must uh, remember shockwave lithotripsy. It's still there, and we are still using shockwave uh, lithotripsy since the 80s. But uh, we must say that we improve uh, in terms of uh, ergonomy for shockwave. We improve also uh, in terms of uh, imaging. And we also uh, improve in terms of uh, treatment optimization before shockwave, during the shockwave, and after shockwave lithotripsy. But we need to recognize that regarding shockwave uh, uh, lithotripsy, unfortunately, we didn't improve the results in terms of uh, stone free rate. What about PCNL in the uh, same period of time? Not too many uh, improvements. We change the position, and as you know, the European people and the rest of the world were, were pushing a lot to change from the prone to the supine position with no clear uh, benefits demonstrate. Actually, we also push a lot to the miniaturization of uh, this uh, technique, PCNL. But again, if we check the results, we didn't really improve, actually, the, the stone free rates. If we look at uh, flexible uh, ureteroscopy, so the retrograde approach, we must say that we uh, observe a huge uh, improvement in terms of equipment. The first one was uh, the new uh, endoscopes, the, this new generation with a complete uh, deflection, 270 degrees. Then we moved to the first uh, digital endoscope, then the first uh, single-use digital flexible ureteroscope from uh, Boston, and finally, this new laser technology coming uh, recently in 2018. If we look at the guidelines, and I just put some examples from 2011 to 2022, we also uh, see that uh, the indication change in favor of a flexible ureteroscopy. If we look at the international guidelines, and if we compare uh, the American guidelines and the European guidelines, PCNL is still the gold standard for a kidney stone more than two centimeters. But we have good data starting in uh, 1998, in the late 90s, with Dr. Bagley, Dr. Grasso, and as you know, they already demonstrate it was feasible to treat big stones uh, uh, using a flexible ureterorhinoscopy. We have excellent review paper, actually, to demonstrate that it's really feasible but we have to accept to do multiple sessions uh, compared to what we do with PCNL in one session. If we look at the evolution of stone treatment, when we compare a, a ureteroscopy, shockwave, and PCNL, again, we need to admit that flexible uh, ureteroscopy slowly replaces shockwave lithotripsy and actually is slowly replacing uh, PCNL. So the debates between uh, retrograde intrarenal surgery and PCNL is actually not uh, a very uh, fair uh, debate since uh, PCNL is still actually the gold standard with immediate uh, stone free rate compared to uh, flexible ureteroscopy. And the arguments are very simple. And if you ask Noor to give you uh, his arguments in favor of uh, PCNL, he will tell you it's faster. We need less equipment, less cost, less session. Patients are more stone-free in one session compared to flexible ureteroscopy. So we will see that it's uh, more uh, efficient. So what do we need, actually, if we would like to fight again uh, um, against our PCNL? We need better laser. And when we said better laser, it means that we need new lasers able to go faster and to go finer at the same time. If you think about this concept, to go faster and finer at the same time, it seems it's um, the uh, opposite. 
And of course, we need vacuum cleaner to uh, obtain stone-free patients in one session. Laser in neurology, what do we have today? We have Holmium, very well known since 30 years, and we have this new Tulium fiber, the TFL uh, equipment. Both of them are pulsed laser, meaning that we need to set the laser according to the energy, frequency, and pulse duration of peak power. Holmium is used since 1992, and it's actually the gold standard in 2022. In endourology, we can do everything with the Holmium technology. We can treat any kind of stones. We can ablate urotelial tumor. We can treat stenosis. We can coagulate. What did we have in terms of improvement in the last 20 years? We have the MOSIS technology. You know this pulse modulation. It was the first time that a company was able to modulate this pulsed laser. Um, originally and from the lab, the MOSIS technology was uh, supposed to be superior. Even today, we don't have clear data to support in clinical practice the superiority of tulium fiber uh, over uh, of um, uh, MOSIS technology, sorry, over the, the regular uh, MOSIS uh, effect. We have also high power system that we can compare to the low power. Uh, what do you obtain when you are using a high power system? You are using uh, um, only, you obtain only a high frequency system. So the question is, by using high frequency, do we really improve the results compared to the low power Holmiumiac technology? In fact, if you check the results, um, comparing uh, Holmiumiac low and high frequency, so low and high power, uh, there is actually no um, um, difference in terms of complications, stone free rate, or operating time if you report operating time to the stone uh, volume. So in terms of Holmiumiac technology, we, we can say that there is no benefit today to use a high power system for flexible ureteroscopy. <coughs> MOSIS 2.0, what does it mean? It means that you will obtain just a little bit more frequency, up to 120 hertz, compared to the regular one, 80 hertz. Again, do we need this or not? Actually, nobody knows. But we know the limitations of Holmium Yag. The fragments are still too big, actually, to be aspirated or to spontaneously evacuate, and it's really time consuming. So again, we need today new equipment, a new laser technology uh, to go faster and finer. And one of the concepts is to uh, uh, use a new system able to use smaller fiber to produce uh, smaller pieces, to, use, to produce lower energy, to keep a low energy density inside a smaller fiber, and to use very high frequency to compensate and to go faster. If we uh, check this uh, concept regarding Holmium Yag, Holmium Yag is not the laser that we can expect for the future since it's impossible to use smaller fiber to produce low energy per pulse and to uh, compensate with very high frequency. Tulium fiber laser was introduced uh, very recently and it seems that this laser uh, will um, uh, match with this uh, new concept. It's still a pulsed laser emitting in the infrared spectrum, but it's 4.5 times more absorbed in uh, water uh, compared to uh, Holmium Yag. Pulse duration and peak power are completely different if we compare to uh, Holmium Yag with a very low peak power. Actually, the max is 500 watts, reducing uh, re-tropulsion and fiber burn back. Uh, and the pulse duration is much, much longer compared to uh, a long pulse with Holmium Yag. What are the three main benefits of Tulium Fiber? It's possible to produce very low energy per pulse, what we uh, fix in our, our concept with the new uh, technology. It's able to, use, to produce very high frequency, up to 2,000 pulses per second. And it's possible to use very small fiber, up to 50 microns, even actually only 150 microns are commercially available. 100 microns are coming very soon. So if we check the Tulium fiber technology regarding the concept, 
it looks that uh, this laser is probably the one that we need, able to produce low energy, to use smaller fiber, and to compensate with very high frequency. So what do we have in terms of uh, uh, data uh, coming from the lab? In the lab, when we compare holmium yak to tulium fiber, tulium fiber is all the time superior to uh, holmium yak technology in terms of dusting, produ production of dust, and uh, in terms of speed, going much faster. It's uh, really demonstrated actually that in the same condition, we produce two times more dust um, uh, compared to holmium yak technology. What about dust? What is the definition of dust actually? We have to fix some limits, and these limits depend on what we will, would, would like to do with the dust. If we think that we need to aspirate the dust using a working channel of 3.6 um, charrière, so it means one millimeter, we need to produce particles less than 250 microns to be able to completely aspirate um, uh, the dust. So 250 micron is probably a new limit to achieve with a laser technology to be able to aspirate at the same time the dust. Tulium fiber is able to produce this specific dust less than 250 micron with any kind of uh, stone. It's actually demonstrated that if you are using uh, 150 micron fiber, you can produce uh, this uh, dust less than 250 uh, micron. It's also demonstrated some uh, um, benefits of tulium fiber compared to holmium yak. Um, going, um, producing much less uh, retropulsion compared to holmium yak, less burn back. So it's one of the reasons uh, tulium fiber is superior to holmium yak. So if we summarize the three, um, the three benefits, it's going faster. We produce more dust. We produce uh, less retropulsion. If we look actually about the clinical uh, evidence, so the real life, um, we have very few, few publications actually. This is the one that we uh, published uh, last year regarding our initial experience. It's not randomized and we didn't compare to uh, Holmium in a randomized way, but we just compared to our uh, historical experience with um, uh, Holmium YAG. And when we do this comparison, actually, we can conclude that we are going two times faster when we are using uh, tulium uh, fiber. In terms of stone free rate, we're not able actually to conclude. If you look at this uh, publication from the Nordic uh, colleagues, uh, they uh, compare um, prospectively tulium fiber uh, laser and holmium yak, and they conclude that they were going faster. There are less complications, and more patients were stone free by using uh, tulium fiber. So if we uh, come back to these uh, improvements in the last 20 years, we must say that tulium fiber will probably play a major role in the future to uh, treat bigger and bigger stone. Only problem is how can we actually remove the fragments uh, at the same time. It's good to go faster and finer, but we still have the problem actually of uh, sectioning. We use regularly some tips and tricks, um, uh, like the Venturi uh, effect. Uh, you know this Venturi effect, very well described with uh, mini PCNL, but it works also uh, retrogradely into the ureter to remove some, uh, some uh, fragments. We have also some new equipment able to aspirate at the same time, even those instruments actually are not the perfect solution, but it just demonstrates actually that it's feasible actually to uh, aspirate. Just by using a simple syringe, if you're able to uh, produce these uh, 250 microns uh, uh, particles, it's also possible to aspirate the dust uh, using a simple syringe with um, uh, the working channel. There's no discussion that in the very near future, a new system to aspirate will come uh, very, very soon since uh, new equipment, single-use equipment are actually uh, available. So we are there today, but we will move to this, and there is a uh, to my point of view, no discussion that we will uh, um, be able to produce um, a system to aspirate the dust and then 
we will really compete with PCNL and it will be the death of uh, PCNL. And I thank you for your attention.